Commanders family, this is the Next Man Up podcast. And we have special guests for you. We have Quan Martin. We have to go back a little bit to Arizona where me and Quan Martin caught up before the road trip ended. Then we have a true legend, Hall of Famer, first ballot Hall of Famer, Champ Bailey joins the show to talk about his time in Washington and how happy he is to be back in the fold. Then we got to get some national love. Kay Adams joins the show to talk about the things she's seen from the Washington Commanders. All that starts now on Next Man Up. What's good, Commanders family? This is Next Man Up. I'm your host, Brian Cooper Jr. here with somebody extremely special, Quan Martin. My brother, man, it's good to see you. Appreciate you, man. Yes, Thank sir. you for having me. I think last time we sat down like this, you was a yeah, rookie. Yeah, this was uh, probably like OTAs last man, year? Yeah, camp, man, sometimes. like, yeah, like 10 months yeah, ago type stuff, yeah, man. Well, like, you were, you were really a rookie and like, things have changed for you. Yeah. Tell us what has changed for you in year two since that last time we spoke. Uh, really, man, just being able to learn, grow, develop, you know, just kind of find my way in the league and, uh, you know, just get in where I fit in pretty much, man. And you know, just really just building that name, making that name for myself. Yeah, and you, and you really fit in well, man. You yeah. know, you're getting a lot of love. You were okay. named the captain for Arizona. What did that mean to you? Were you surprised? Uh, I don't know, because I, I was captain during the <laughs> preseason. Yeah. And I kind of felt it coming. Yeah. And uh, today in the meeting, he was like, I got a captain. I was like, dang, I got a feeling he might call me. I kind of felt it coming a yeah. little bit. So, you know, uh, but it was great, man. Uh, just to, you know, hear my name come up, see my, you know, picture up on the board and coach just telling me, that, you know, that I'm captain for this game, man, means a lot. Uh, you know, this stuff I talk about with my family all the time, man, just, you know, j just trying to set an example for everybody, uh, you know, back where I'm from, kids in my uh, neighborhood, man, just, you know, showing them that you can do it, you know, it is possible. And, uh, Man, you know, it's just a great opportunity to go out there and represent this program. And you've been playing since you were five years old, man. Yeah. So to have that C on your jersey, man, what does that mean to you? I mean, it means a lot, man. Uh, my first time really just being the captain and since I've been playing, <laughs> man. So uh, it's been great, man. Uh, never had the opportunity in college to be, you know, captain on the team. So just to uh, be a captain at this level just, you know, kind of speaks for itself. I think what's so special about that is this is a new coaching staff. Right. This is not a coaching staff that drafted you. Right. And they didn't keep a lot of people around, but you not only was kept, but you also were named a starter. Right. What is it like to get that kind of respect before you even played a regular season game? Yeah, man, it means a lot. Uh, you know, I, obviously we talked with, you know, Coach Quinn and Adam Peters, you know, before things kind of got rolling. And, um, you know, he just kind of told me where my role could be on this team, man. I embraced it, man. I just went out, worked hard, you know, put my head down and just kept grinding, man. And, you know, just kind of, you know, made it impossible to go unnoticed. So mm -hmm. I feel like that's what I've always done my whole career. And I'm sure there come, there's different expectations that come with having a right. new coaching staff. And I remember you saying preseason that the coaches want you to be more vocal. Yeah. How's that been so far? Because you're a very chill, yeah, yeah. quiet guy. How has that been, man? <laughs> oh, man, it's, it's been great. I feel like not even just Coach Quinn, but really just everybody in the building just, you know, pushing me to be more vocal. Bobby Wagner, you know, everybody just standing on me, man, when they, you know, at times they couldn't really hear me on the field. So uh, Coach Quinn always said, like, would you want to be led by you? So, wow. you know, like when he say that, I'm like, okay, like, like, let me make sure I'm getting the calls out, everybody can hear them, and I uh, just show my leadership on the field. You told me last time we sat and spoke, you said that what motivates you is being overlooked. You were under-recruited. You've been playing your whole life. Right. Even the second round pick, you know, yeah. I'm sure you felt like you were supposed yeah. to go on the first. So what motivates you now? Because now you're getting that recognition. Yeah. Now you're getting the love. Now people are really starting to see who you are. So what motivates you now? Uh, really, man, just this team, uh, the guys around me, and uh, just not want to let the team down, man. And uh, you know, just trying to put my best foot forward. And, you know, just knowing that these coaches believe in me, my teammates believe in me, and, uh, you know, I'm just going to go out and get them my best every play, every down, every game, and I feel like it shows. You, you got a new running mate in Jeremy Chen, and yeah. uh, I'm sure you hadn't seen it, but I, I spoke to him, and we had a moment. It was very yeah. weird, man. I'm not that lost for words often, yeah. but Jeremy Chen's like, I'm pissed off, and he just got yeah. real, real angry. What has it been like playing next to a guy like that that really, like, he locks in when he's yeah. on that field? Oh, uh, man, he's been, you know, somebody I've looked up to since day one, man, just, you know how he carries himself in the building how he handles himself uh on the practice field so you know just kind of 
taking little things from him and he don't really even know it, but you know, I'm peeping, you know, right. everything he's doing, you know, how he handle every situation, man. And so I've, I've really learned a lot from that dude. And, um, you know, he's just been that voice for me, that ear for me, that leader. And, um, you know, he's just been pushing me to communicate more, like I said, and um, it's been great, man, to play alongside him. Yeah, we had an event where it was me, you, and Jeremy Chin. Yeah. During that event, you said something I thought was very interesting because I, it didn't really dawn on me yeah. that this is really your first time getting to focus on yeah. one position. You said yeah. that you're like, man, this is my first time yeah. not having to be all over right. the field, man. Yeah. Why is that? Why is that so important to you this season, and why has that been so beneficial for you? Um, I just feel like you know it allowed me to reach my full potential, um, and you know. I can do it, but just floating around everywhere, man, I feel like it's kind of hard to really just lock in on the small details at each and every position. But um, yeah, man, it's just been special for me. And uh, I talked to my mom, my parents, my girlfriend, every everybody about, you know, just the focus that comes with, you know, playing a position and the coaches, like I said, it just pushed me to be more vocal, be that leader and uh, just be that voice on this defense. Quan, you've been so special this year, man. I can't wait to see what you do Sunday against the, the Browns. We'll be back home again. That'll be our first time back yeah. home. We've been on a little road trip. Yeah. The fans have showed up and showed out for us, man. Yeah. On this road, we've seen them so much. Right. And then at the home game, yeah. it was yeah. crazy, man. How excited are you to see those fans again after being on the road for so long? Ah, uh, man, I, super excited, man, just to go in and, and play another home game. Uh, you know, I feel like the fans, they've, they've been, uh, you know, pretty excited, you know, with everything going on in the building, uh, with the program. And, uh, you know, I just feel like, you know, it's time for us to take that next step. and. Uh, just get the fans what they want to see. Hey, Quan, man, it's been great seeing you develop, man. Man, can't wait to see you out on that field, brother. Appreciate right, man, your time, appreciate man. You. Appreciate yes, you sir. having me. Now, Commanders family, I have to bring in a very special friend of mine. She pulled up for training camp and saw all the great things we were doing out here, and it's continued to show the Burgundy and Gold a lot of national love. Now, Commanders family, it's not always the next man up. Sometimes it's the next woman up. And for the first time, we have a woman on the show, so we're gonna call it Next Woman Up. She is from National Media. She has a big time show. Welcoming in, Kay Adams. How are you doing? I'm so great, Next Woman Up, let's do this. Yes, we love it, we love it. And what <laughs> we like to talk about, we like to talk about, you know, our past, what got us here. And just like me, we don't end up in our seats, right? We don't end up doing what we do unless we love the game of football. So you tell me, when did you find your love for football? Oh, man, I started to love football uh, growing up in Chicago. I was uh, I was raised by two Polish immigrants who'd never heard of football. And the Bears were very good or competitive. Uh, and me and my brother just wanted to figure out what's like the most American communal, bring everybody together thing everybody's talking about. We, of course, had the Bulls at that point with Michael Jordan, but still football was huge in Chicago. So, you know, we had Matt Forte and we had Devin Hester um, to root for uh, as I was growing up. And then I really liked fantasy football. If you were to really ask me, like, at what point was I like, I really love this? It's the fact that I'm really competitive. So when I got in my first year, drafted my team, didn't really know the players very well, learned about them. I won my league the first year I played with, I think like, I'm trying to think of who it was. Matt Forte was definitely on my team. And at that point it was, you have this wealth of knowledge about 32 teams and all these different players, not just the 53 in your hometown. Um, and I loved that and the competitive nature of it. And I think that just the storylines of it and getting my heart broken, watching the Bears lose to the Colts after that Devin Hester touched down like that sort of a, is where it snapped my heart. But uh, similarly to you, you have, you know, what you're saying, you have to love the game. I love celebrating the game. I love that. I'm still at this point curious about absolutely everything, every team, every storyline. And that's really what's driven me to keep loving it as much as I do. And I'm sure that's what keeps you so interesting when you do these interviews, when you talk, because you have, you know, you're inquisitive, you want to know things and we see some great stuff. And you actually were here during training camp. You had the chance to go to a few training camps, I think like 12 or 14, like 20. a few spots. How many? 20. 20. Oh my goodness. 20, 20 different training camps. And you came to kick it with us. It was so hot. It was just a day, but you got to see what a lot of people are seeing now. You got to see Jaden Daniels and company and see what they could do. When you were back here in training camp, did you really like see what was going to be happening? Did you have a feeling that, hey, Commander's about to do something special? I thought he was, how he looked out there and I liked his, and it's what I still like now. I just liked his composure. Mm. I liked how he was carrying himself out there. Um, but I will say my big takeaway, I loved meeting you and you brought a lot of energy to, to 
our life for on Up and Adams in that trip. It was so hot. I remember we were so well taken care of by the commanders. Um, I, my takeaway was, oh man, they don't want me to blow up their spot. My thought was, and I sat with Dan Quinn for 20 minutes and I sat with Payne and I, you know, got to hang out with, you know, the now departed Jahan Dotson and every, and Bobby Wagner, who I've known for years and years and years, the, I, the sort of takeaway was like, don't like, don't talk about us. You know, at that point, DQ was unwilling to name Jaden the starter. And I was like, oh, no, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? But it was all a really thoughtful, methodical way of carrying out this vision that they've all had. And I really took away this kid is special and they don't want anybody to know about it until week one. Of course, we saw what he did in college and we know that he's a special player, but he's sort of a, a one of one player as well. So uh, I, I knew it, I knew it was a secret they were trying to keep a lid on. That's what I knew. Okay, we appreciate you keeping that secret for us, but not a secret style. Now we know what we have in Jaden Daniels. Real quick, you say you talked to Dan Quinn. You got to talk to a lot of coaches during your tour. What about Dan Quinn stood out to you? I think he never gets enough credit for um, what a uh, transcendent leader he is. And it's not always superstars. He's somebody, whether you have a vet, you know, he's somebody that, you know, Aaron Rodgers, I think he could coach him well. I think he can coach a young rookie like Jaden Daniels and everything in between. And not every coach is like that. Um, he is so thoughtful. I believe that would be a word that I would use to describe him as far as a leadership style. I think he's very organized and mindful about what he wants to execute, what Jaden needs, what these veterans need um, in the messaging. He's always been like that back. Even when I knew him with the Falcons, it was about mottos. It was about buying in. It's about toughness, high energy. And that's the kind of coaching that's really working in the NFL right now. Um, he had so much success, of course, uh, Matt Ryan, MVP year, MVP candidate. And and now we see what he's doing with Jaden. And, and as, as special as Jaden is, we have to give Dan credit for that. And, and I love talking to people like you who are outside, right? You're the national media, so you're not here. I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid every day. So me, I'm going to be feeling good. I'm going to be feeling like we're going to be winning every single game because that's my job to do that. But you, you're the national media. You're on the outside. So you tell me, at 3-1 and one right now, how do you feel about the Washington Commanders? Are we for real? Oh, you know, it's so funny because you're on the inside, but I, I'm friends with Kevin Durant now, with, you know, uh, over on FanDuel. Yeah. He's the biggest Commanders fan. I will say it's a very interesting experience to have. Sometimes, you know, teams really buy into their hype. Sometimes fans enjoy it, uh, which is actually really rare. And then sometimes fans are really demanding and the Bears are like that, you know, like they're not giving Caleb much patience, much, much of that. And commanders are different. I think that it's a fan base that's waited for it so long. Um, on the outside, it's very fun to see guys like a Kevin Durant or some some fans, some celebrity fans, listen, guys that I've known for a long time, women that I've known for a long time who have never told me that they're commanders fans are like, thanks for saying that about my commanders. And I'm like, you're commanders. And they're like, no, lifelong fan. But for whatever reason, I don't even know about it. So there's certainly this, this uh, excitement that I'm feeling. And when it comes to ball, absolutely, they should be considered a contender. On Up and Adams today, in talking about where Devontae Adams should go, I had a list of contenders. And among those, Cowboys, oh sorry, and among the Jets and the reuniting with you know Aaron Rodgers, I put the Commanders because that's a team that has – the space, the need, they were interested in Brandon Ayuk. And what I'm saying more about the, the holistic big part of it is that's a team that I would love to make that move because it shows you just how all in they are for this year. And, and I love that because we know you're a Devontae Adams friend, right? We know that you guys are good. So I'm hoping you're giving him a little bit of extra like, hey, man, you know, burgundy and gold ain't too bad. You know, maybe we talk to the ages and make that happen. But you just were part of this Devontae Adams debacle, right? Now, we don't want to speculate on where he will go, however. I, I find it very, I admire it because I understand what it's like, right? Having these personal relationships with players, but then having to do our jobs as well. How tough is it knowing that like y'all would have a regular conversation about this and this and that, but then having to do your job in a way where you can't really spill the beans on what a player like that's going to do, but you guys have a relationship where you probably kind of know where his head's really at. I'm just as curious as everybody else to see what happens. <laughs> uh, I said it on my show this morning. I think I want, I know that I want him to be happy and I want him to be playing meaningful football and I want him to get a ring. I think he deserves it. I think it'd be so nice if he made the move to, you know, secure the bag and, and be with his old quarterback and it didn't work out. And now the move gets made where he does get to contend on a team. Uh, I think last week I asked him about Jaden Daniels before a lot of this was going on and he was emphatic. He went so far as to say, and I do think Devontae Adams is a very easy interview, very honest, very, he doesn't think about it as he's already thought about the question. He sort of knows the line of questioning in his head. 
Um, and he's a, a true adult, like a true adult in, in the way he carries himself and always has. So it's very, uh, it's a very easy interview because sometimes you worry about how a question is going to be taken or how to ask a question in a way that's going to be respectful or to get the information you want, where I don't really have that with Devante. I really can ask him anything and I know he'll understand what I'm, uh, he'll, he'll say what he's going to say, which he has this entire time. Um, but I asked him about Jaden and I didn't, I, I was a little surprised. I didn't think I'd get as emphatic of a response where he said, man, I thought we, you know, I think he was sort of joking saying, man, I, I you know, if he'd fallen to us, we, if only he had fallen to the Raiders and, you know, the, the internet had their way with that. But really what he's saying is I'm seeing how special this young player is that me at my age, I, I would love to play with him. I see his skills. Like vets don't give rookies love like that. They just don't. So that's all you needed to hear from a guy like Adams on this. But as far as where he's going to go, wouldn't that be wild to have him there? Like absolutely wild. I can't even imagine what that city would be like. It would make my job a lot more. <laughs> Let me tell you, my job's already extremely interesting. So you talk about these places that Devontae Adams may fit. So let's just talk about the commanders. Why do you think? Why was he, why were the commanders on your list of places that he would be a good fit for? I think because a lot of it is, uh, I think Adam Peters did a really good job of foundationally getting this team to where it needs to be. And when you're sitting there at three and a run and you're looking at the complexion of the division that you're in and you feel the confidence that Cliff Kingsbury brings you and that this young quarterback brings you, like, where's the time to waste sort of a situation? And we heard the rumors, I'm sure you did as well, you know more than I do, about their interest in Brandon Ayuk. In the off season, they were, you know, interest. If they were, they were asking or interested in acquiring him. Why would they not feel that way uh, with Javante Adams? So that sort of made sense. I think Adam Peters has it in him. It takes a certain sort of GM to feel supported by his ownership group and to feel like the coaching is here right now in the here and now to make it happen. And it sort of seems like it's all working right now. And I couldn't be more excited. Hey, I love your energy and optimism on it. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Just like <laughs> you, I have no insider info, but just like the rest of the fans. Yeah, do you need him? It's a great question. See, that's not an answer for me to ask because to me, it's like, get a weapon, you get a weapon, right? However, I love the receivers, the tight ends. I love the weapons we already have in the building. And we three and one, so it's hard to say we need really anything. Yeah, I would just say, like, if you don't get him and he goes to the Jets or you don't want to go to the Cowboys, him and CD, that we don't want, we don't want that if we're watching. <laughs> If he goes, you know, if he goes somewhere and you don't get him, like, I still, I wouldn't cry about it if I was Washington, not right now. Yeah, right. There's so many other things to be optimistic about. And you don't really see that like here. Like you always want that big name free agent. Like people freak out about it. But now that things are going so well, people are kind of chilling like, oh, you know, if it happens, it happens. You know, it's, it's a different type of energy. And Kay, I, I know you're busy. I know you got a lot of people in your crib right now. I appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> but one more question for you before we go. We have the Cleveland Browns. Now, I'm not sure if you went to Cleveland during your training camp visits. Uh, However, I do know you're very familiar with all NFL teams. So ask you. What kind of challenges does a team like the Cleveland Browns pose for the commanders? Yes, we know they're struggling right now. However, they still have a guy in Deshaun Watson that can get it done. I've got to be honest, I don't think it's a challenge. And I hope that this, I obviously don't want this commander's team to be looking past them, but this should be a team that's looking and staring down, you know, four and one uh, by being consistent, by having Jaden be as special as he is. And I would say, it, I, I really don't see the challenge. I feel like um, the Browns are inconsistent and they, what they lack is what, the commanders have and that's confidence and that's poise and you're seeing a very uh lack of confidence on that offense with the browns uh and i would say i would say that the most impressive thing i've seen i mean there's obviously lots to be excited about with the commander's offense but Jaden, when he made he doesn't do it often but he made a mistake you know and once when he makes a mistake that's when i'm watching i'm saying oh boy how is he going to handle himself how's and for him to just no problem pull it together. That is veteran. That is poised. That is, I'm not afraid that if he turns the ball over, that he's not getting it back, cheering on his defense, and he's going to go right down and score. We've seen that now. And I think that gives that gives them the edge going into this game. And it better not be close, Commanders. <laughs> Jay, I love the optimism. And you know what? It sounds like we're starting to make you a Burgundy and Gold fan slowly, but surely. You don't got to change your fandom yet, but we're going we gonna to bring you over on this side. <laughs> I wanted to go to a game so bad. I was supposed to come for the Giants opener and then I wasn't able to come. And now I'm really, really trying to get down there. But but yes, just so everybody knows, Kevin Durant is uh, comes on uh, up in Adams and he told me he's picking the commanders every week that he comes out. He's a true, like a like a sick pup level fan. So and I'm sure everybody uh, out there knows that as well. So he will be cheering on the commanders and I will be uh, helping be the hype girl, too.
Hey, we love that. Hopefully you can get Kay on next man up as well. We can have y'all both yes. on. We love the burgundy and gold love. Kay, thank you so much for your time. As always, we appreciate you. I love seeing what you're doing with Up and Adams. And just you're just you're just a shooting star taking off, man. So thank you you're so much. You're amazing. Time. You have Keep the best vibes in the business. That should be on your little like uh, under title here. I'll take pride in that and I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Thank you. I'll see you. So you. I'll see you soon. I promise. Yes, man. Command this family. Our next woman up from Up and Adams. Hey, Adams. Thank you so much, Kay. Commander's family, for our next man up, you know we love to bring in a legend. And this one is a true legend. 15 years in the NFL. Hall of Fame career. Holds so many records for a defensive back. Was drafted here in the first round, seventh overall. And is just a true legend. One of the best to ever do it in this game. Welcome me in, Champ Bailey. My boy got the locs on. He's, he's comfy and feeling good. <laughs> yeah, man. Thanks for having me, man. I'm chilling. Oh, man. It's a blessing to have you. And, and we, we have so much to talk about. Um, but I want to start in the beginning, man. I want to start in the beginning when you got drafted to Washington. No, that was a while ago. But take us back there. What was young Champ Bailey feeling, thinking, being drafted so high, going in the first round and accomplishing those dreams? Yeah, man, 25 years ago. You know, I think back then, man, I just wanted to play ball. That, that's, that's all that mattered. When you're young, I was 20 years old when they called my name. You know, sort of a dramatic draft. But at that time, I was just – I just wanted to play ball. And I was fortunate enough to come to a team that – you know, a story franchise, uh, the hottest division in football, it, it, it just, it worked out perfectly. And then, you know, the people I got to connect with, that's a whole nother story. And it's, it's not every day a rookie comes in and has a locker room right next to Daryl Green and then a locker right next to Deion Sanders. Those are Hall of Fame players and you're coming in and getting that pedigree right away. How valuable was that yeah. for a young Chad Bailey? Well, very valuable. Well, if you remember, it was just Daryl at first. Mm. And, you know, our defensive back coach, Tom Hayes, really just put me under Daryl's wing and and, and Daryl taught me all he, he could, right? It, it, was, it, was, it was interesting because we were two different type of players as far as how we were built, you know, the things we could do. You know, I was a press corner. He was off. You know, just stand step for step with guys. That's That was his M.O. But the things I learned from him were, were crucial to the early part of my career. I mean, I, I, I mean, honestly, man, if I didn't have him in those moments, I didn't know how to play corner until we got together. Like, I, I, I was an athlete. I mean, you, you could see I could do things, but and I had the tools. But ultimately, man, it was – it was his tutelage that really got me over the top and solidified who I was going to be early in my career. What were some of those things that he did tell you that helped you? Like, you know, as, as, as people that, that don't play the game, right? They're like, man, what are those that advice that you get? But it could be anything under the sun. It could be life things. It could be family things. It could be financial things. What were some of those things that you did get from Daryl Green? Well, he used to have this saying, uh, he still uses it, I'm sure. Like, your hands are great, but your feet are better. Mm -hmm. And what he meant is, you know, when, when I play bump and run, the thing about Daryl, he don't, he don't like to touch people at the line. He, he never did. He, his thing was, I'm just going to move with you. You go, you go lateral, I'm going lateral too. And, and he would always tell me, you know, it's great you got these long arms. You're strong and all this you got a bigger body type, but it's really about your feet. And I teach that now when, when I'm teaching any young kid about anything, it, it's, it's all about your feet and, you know, just, just narrowing in and focusing in on what was important. And then my hands were just the bonus and I bought into it. I bought into it because I saw him do it. You know, he was good at it. And I'm like, man, if I could put that in my game, where it's not about if I touch you, it's more about if I can stay with you. And, you know, it, it really helped me become a great bump and run cor corner, you know, early in my career. And you're competing and growing as a corner, and then they bring Deion yeah. Sanders in, one of, a legend, yeah. right? One of the best to ever do it, man. How did that affect you? Well, that, 
sort of solidify everything Daryl was saying, because you got to think my rookie year is really just a process of me buying in. But then here comes Dion. And then what I realized, you know, Dion would do things, but he was he was always conscious of his footwork. Now, this is later in his career. He's really buying into his technique. And, you know, he would get in this motorcycle stance and, you know, people would always, you know, try to emulate that. But not only was it a fear tactic, it was still he would when he wouldn't go at you, he would still come back to base and being square and trying to move with you. So it was always about the feet. And I'm more built like Dion than Daryl. Like we're both taller, longer corners, you know, with great speed and quickness. And to be able to understand and buy into the the aspect of your feet being the integral part of why you stay toe to toe with these bigger receivers and these quick guys. I mean, it, it really, it really solidified what I was going to be or what I could be. And, and what did it do for your confidence? Cause I read somewhere that when Dion comes in, you're immediately right. Like he's the OG. So you're like, you know what? He's the starter. He's taking it all, but that wasn't necessarily the case. Was it for you? No, it wasn't. Hmm. You know, what's funny is that's, that was my initial thought. Like I'm not starting. <laughs> Here's two of my idols. They're obviously going to play before me. But I was reassured by North Turner, like, no, you're starting. One of them coming off the bench. Like, it's, you know, because I think they knew that I was I was in for a great second year because of how I finished my rookie year. You know, I, I really I think that one playoff game we won that year, I had a really good game. I mean, it was it was just one of those things like, oh, man. Coming off this offseason, this kid is ready. And I think they knew that. And I felt it too, but I still, these are my idols. I ain't playing before them. <laughs> but it worked out great because, you know, they wanted to see me grow and become what they had already done. And, you know, it was a beautiful thing. And, and Champ, I really just don't think young corners get that type of, like, game and that type of just path that you had. No. What is your favorite memory from Washington, from your playing days in Washington? You know, it. I got, I got some good memories, and it's more about the people I played with. I mean, you mentioned two of the greatest, right, two first ballot Hall of Fame corners, and I give them a lot of credit for getting me on that first ballot. But it's the Bruce Smith. Uh, oh, man. Sam Shade, Leo Mike Evans. I mean, these guys that were – uh, they were they they had something to do with my growth as a young player. Daryl mm -hmm. Pounds, who who the guy I replaced uh, as a starter. I mean, I started from my first game, but he was the starter. You know, all through spring, summer, we got the training camp. He was a starter, and then I ended up starting before the first game. But he didn't let that get in the way of him mentoring me, teaching me little things. It was just it was just great to to have that kind of mentorship early. So I mean, that's what I really remember the most because I, every time I see a guy get drafted, I'm always looking at well, who's his vets? Like who are the guys that are gonna be you know? And and you don't know where that leadership or that mentorship is gonna come from when you walk in the door because you don't know these guys. You just see them. I didn't think Bruce Smith would take to me and look at me as a potential. Hall of Famer like himself. Like, they, these guys were already Hall of Famers before I ever stepped on the field with them. So having that, it, 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 really, it, it really helped me early on because I knew what success looked like, and I got to witness it every day. We talk about these Washington memories. I always think of this photo that I see all the time because, as you know, I, I work with Fred Smoot quite a lot. So, you know, we're looking oh, yeah. him up and doing yeah. different things. And there's this photo of you, Daryl Green, and Fred Smoot walking down the field. Y'all in y'all yeah. uniforms. <laughs> what was it like <laughs> being a veteran, I guess? Well, you were still young as well, but having a young guy like Fred Smoot come into the building and come into the locker room. It, I mean, it was it was fun. It was It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of good time together. I think it, it gave a different dynamic. But, you know, the thing about Smooth is he was just as hungry as I was. You know, he thought he was the best. He, he played and practiced like it. And I would like to think he took some of those traits that I could show him at th that young age 
of how to be successful because I'm coming off my first Pro Bowl, and then he comes in, Dion goes out, but Daryl's still there. So we do have our steady hand at the top. You know, we all respected him and, you know, his leadership. But here's Smooth, who hasn't changed a bit. So if you've been around him, you know yeah. <laughs> how he was even back then. Like, it was even worse back then. Like, how, how loud and disruptive he were, he was. But he, but I think all in all, what mattered the most is that he wanted to be a great football player. He thought he was, and he worked like it. And, man, he was the most fun teammate I've ever been around because – it, it, it wasn't nothing he wasn't down to do with. Me. So, it, you know, we had some really good times together. I learned some things from him, you know, just, just little stuff, man. You know, the way he played, he couldn't do some of the things I could do, and I couldn't do some of the things he could do. Like, it was just, you know, that's Daryl always had this saying, man, there's no real book on how to play corner. Like, you got to figure out what works for you. There's some things that are constant, but all in all, man, we're all different. We all going to get it done differently. And the same way you talk about Fred is the same way he talks about you, man. He reveres you guys so much for being those OGs that just helped him out, being those guys that helped him just kind of ease his way into the NFL because that's that's a tough locker room to go in and compete with, right? When you got two guys that are really yeah, established like that. And, you know, now that you're, you're back in the fall, man, let me tell you, there is nobody these fans love more than Fred Smoot. And I don't know, outside of you and Daryl, I don't know if there's anybody that can give us those Fred Smoot stories. So if you would give us just that one favorite memory, of your time in Fresno, whether he's being crazy, whether he's talking trash in the locker room, because we hear stories all the time. But I'd love to hear I, it from somebody else. <laughs> I never forget this one time. Well, I got two little things for you, but one is more embarrassing for me. One is <laughs> kind of his personality. So, you know, as rookies, you know, I wouldn't say it was hazing, but we would always make them do certain things. And, and I can't remember what the demand was from Smooth. And he just bust out. Man, I'll take the physical challenge. And he had no idea what he was getting himself into. So we ended up taping him to the goalposts. It was, it was just, but it was smooth, though. He was not going to go down the traditional way. He's not going to sing. He's not going to go get food. He, he, he didn't, didn't want to do anything. So he was just like, I'll take the physical challenge. I'm like, what? <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. Of course, I'm not grabbing him and taping him to the goalpost, but I'm making sure the big boys don't hurt him along the way, right? So, so, but that was that was who he was. But it, but there's also this one incident. I was about to be late for practice, and I I don't know if Fred is gonna remember this, but but I t I, I call Smooth. I'm on the other side of the beltway, and I'm like Smooth. I'm 45 minutes out. Practice started 15 minutes. Just tell coach I'm in the bathroom on the toilet. Like, just tell him. <laughs> so our coach at the time, I mean, you got to think. Like, I'm, I'm kind of established. I'm in my fourth or fifth year at this point. And, you know, I can get away with some things. But at the same time, I'm, I'm accountable. And I never did and pushed the envelope. But this one particular time, I just overslept. And I'm on my way to the facility, I mean, I'm trying to, you know, the beltway, unpredictable. Yeah. So I'm in traffic, <laughs> weaving in and out, trying to go back through Potomac and trying, just trying to get down in Virginia to get to practice. And he held it down for me till I got there. Of course, they didn't ask a lot of questions. I remember running out on the field, staying out there for about 20 minutes and running back in like I had to go to the bathroom because <laughs> I had to sell the story. Because... <laughs> Coach thought I had a messed up stomach. It couldn't just be over like that. So it was just one of them things, man. And that's what Smoot was, man. Smoot looked out for me. I looked out for him. And, you know, I never forget those moments with him. Hey, man. And, and Fred talks about those moments a lot, too, man. So it's, it's nothing but love on both sides. of that. I can't wait to talk to him about all this. I'm sure when y'all was taping him to the goalpost, he was talking trash the, oh, yeah, the whole time. time. The whole time. He didn't shut up one second of it. Like, but it was who he was, and we all laughed too. You know, nobody wanted to harm him. You just, you know, sometimes you gotta let rookies know. It's it's great to hear those stories. It sounded like you guys were a true brotherhood, and so then I gotta I gotta move forward to you were traded. You were traded for Clinton Portis. A lot of fans to this day, one of my best friends is a, is a, a Washington fan, and he says it worst trade ever in NFL history because they felt like they lost somebody that they truly loved in a Champ Bailey. Talk to us about 
what you went through during that time. So I'm sure you didn't see it coming, or maybe you did. Um, I know you loved playing here. How did that trade affect you? Bring us back then and, you know, what went down? Well, at the time, they, uh, you know, we were – contract negotiating is, you know, really weird when you're playing. But I remember during that season, my fifth, fifth year, my last year in Washington, they just kept lowballing me. And, you know, I remember the last statement they told my agent was, you'll never get that, what we were asking for. So – that's when they decided, okay, well, we're going to attempt to trade. And they franchised me, then they attempt to trade me. I remember Joe Gibbs called me because he was coming in as new coach. And I never got to play for him, but he called me and was like, I hope we work this out, yada, yada. But, of course, he had no real say in how that was going to work out. We didn't have a relationship, so there was no, like, loyalty I expected from him. But long story short, man, it was just they decided to trade me I told Denver what I wanted if I would – because I could have bucked the trade altogether by not signing the franchise tag, right? And Denver looked at the contract and said, yeah, they, they, they wanted to pay me exactly what I was asking for. So I was like, damn, I should ask for more. But, you know, <laughs> at, that, at that time, that was good enough. But, you know, it happened. And then, you know, I was a little upset with the fact that we were losing Portis. I was like, we, we can't trade somebody else because I'm a running back fan. Yeah, I grew up playing running back. I played running back in high school. I'm a running back fan, and I love Clinton Portis. So I'm like, damn, so we got to go. I got to go to Denver. He's coming here. But the, the, I think the icing on the cake was the second-round pick, which they eventually used to get Tatum Bell. So I'm feeling like, oh, yeah, we got to – we got a good good deal. We got this other fast back from from Oklahoma State, and it worked out. But at the time, man, I did not want Portis to leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> trade somebody else, like anybody but this guy. Like I was a big fan of his and what he did in his short career. I mean, I think he was coming off his second season or something. I can't I can't remember, but he was he was all pro back, and for me, it was just it. It was a little daunting because I didn't know what to expect. I, I think Denver, I think Snow, you know. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going – but I'm going to a team in a franchise that had a good run up to that point and, and having a great run game, always in the playoffs, just always a winning pedigree. I'm, I'm like, it, it's just – it just made – it made sense for me in that point in my career that I make this leap. And then, you know, fortunate enough for guys at that point in their careers, fifth, sixth year, when you move to another team, people look at you as a leader coming in. So I had that respect walking in. Obviously, you know, big responsibility to be a leader going from a guy that was kind of raised in in Washington. But now I'm over here and people think I've done as much as, you know, most guys whole career. No, so it's just, you know, the respect was there. You know, they treated me well, and you know, it was the best thing happened in my career to get traded. But in that moment, right, like now we can look back and say it's the best thing ever. But like you said, you were raised in Washington. You loved it here. Yeah. Did that did. put a chip on your shoulder, not just getting traded, but also, you know, having to go through these negotiations and them not really seeing your value? Did all that put a chip on your shoulder? A little bit. A little bit. You know, I, I wasn't really uh, concerned with the past, and, and it, it did – I think what bothered me is that they didn't respect, you know, what I had done, you know, and it was like, you know, I've been to four straight Pro Bowls in my five years there, you know, and I was an alternate as a rookie. But I think, you know, that really opened my eyes to what really matters. And it was relationships. And, you know, they didn't draft me. Dan Snyder didn't draft me. He, He took over ownership. In the summer after I got drafted by Charlie Cassidy. So when Cassidy ended up leaving before my rookie season, you know, there was no, they weren't loyal to me. I mean, if you remember, they drafted LeVar Aronson and Chris Samuels the next year. Well, LeVar ended up getting a new deal before I left. So, you know, you could tell where the loyalties lied. I mean, and he deserved it, but I did too. So it, it was just, it was just obvious. You know, I wasn't valued. So the best thing was for me to leave. And trust me, I, I tell people all the time, like, 
I have equally as much uh, Washington fans as Denver fans come up to me to this day, tap me on the shoulder, talk about the trade. It's, it's equal. I and mean, it's been like that since I left. <laughs> that was 20 years ago. So, you know, that, so there, it's always been in the back of my mind to be reacclimated with the, with the, uh, the franchise, but it it really did take new ownership to get that done. And before we get on to you being back with the franchise, we we have to talk about that first ballot Hall of Fame because clearly that trade led to what was already a great career turned it into an amazing career, and then you end up being a first ballot Hall of Famer. From everything yeah. you've been through, man, all of that stuff, even that trade, right? All of these things being overlooked. What did that moment mean for you to be able to be on that stage and get that gold jacket? I mean, it was amazing. You got to think, I'm on that stage with some guys I played with, some guys I grew up revering. I mean, it was, dude, it was amazing. And, you know, it's it, people tell me, used to tell me all the time, you know, within those five years I was retired before I'm eligible. Yeah, you're going first ballot, but I never really bought into it because I'm like, man, anything can happen. Like I, there's nothing more I could do to change the minds of these voters, you know, but again, it goes back to relationships. Like I, I just remember being a guy in the locker room that the media could always come up to. And now who's voting the media? It, it's as simple as that. I mean, and, and, you know, that's, that's funny because all these, these things carry over in life. And I'm like, oh, well, football is a part of my life. So why does it not exist here? I've seen so much evidence of how much these relationships mean. And, you know, I try to tell guys all the time, no matter what, like some point your career is going to end and what your value is going to be based off the relationships you built. And I never got away from that. And I, I'm lucky for me, it was natural for me. And I, I think a lot of people, can see how some guys get left off and not get looked at for a Hall of Fame, and they deserve it. There's so many guys that deserve to be in, but I do think there's some people that are not in because they don't have the right – they just didn't rub people the right way for, for whatever reason. And not that it's warranted, but it 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 is what it is. Like, that's just how it is, you know. And, you know, but I did – I do think my resume spoke for itself. So just based off game alone – yeah, you know, I felt like I should have been in, but again, I, it's not in my control. So I felt I felt good because we had three first ballots on my in my class with Ed Reed and Tony Gonzalez, and and then you throw Ty Law in the mix, man. You're talking about a hell of a secondary. Uh, that was a a great class, man. I'm I was just happy to be in, man, with some guys I I love watching. <laughs> Oh, well deserved, man. You were such a monster on that field. And I'm sure Washington fans, you know, they, they miss you because we talked about this before we got on. You had not been back to after being traded. You had not. The last time you had been in Washington was 09. You were playing for the Broncos against us. And then you hadn't been back since until last season. New ownership comes in and decides we are going to make Champ Bailey our legend of the game for our very first home game as new ownership. Which is, a, I don't think people realize how big of a deal that is, especially somebody that hadn't been in the fold in a while. How much did that mean to you to be able to be back on that field, have all those Burgundy and Gold fans yell at you and cheer for you and just be so happy to see you, man? What was that moment like for you after being separated for so long? It was amazing. And it was overdue, you know. And I got to give, you know, Tim Hightower and those guys a lot of credit for, I mean, continuing to reach out and – you know, there were calls for me to come back, but again, before new ownership, but it never felt right. And then when the team was sold, it just felt right at that time. It just, it, they, they, they made me feel like I was part of the family and, and it never was a disconnection mm -hmm. because that's, that's how close knit these circles are when it comes to former athletes and people you work with in this business. I mean, those bonds are strong and it's not it's not hard to reconnect. It's really not like we all could get around and and, and talk about our times as a player or administrator or coach or whatever it may be, an owner, you know, and it, it's one of those circles you always want to be a part of. And I'm just happy to be a part of one of the most storied franchises ever like this. 
I, I never wanted to disconnect, you know, from the franchise. And, you know, but if you're not valued in that way, then I'm not, I'm never going to force my way into somebody's house. That's just not who I am. But I got to give everybody there a lot of credit, man. They're really changing the culture. It's been overdue. As you can tell, it's not hard to do that when when you have a team and a fan base like that. Like, I, like I say, man, there's more people, just as many people come up to me today about my time there. And there's been so many great players. Ken Portis wasn't, wasn't a bust. <laughs> they got something great out of that trade. So it they wasn't did. like... Yeah, it wasn't like I left for nothing. Like he was he was a, a beast. So to be remembered, man, I mean, it's it's gratifying, man. It means a lot. And, and your OG's getting love too. He will be having his jersey retired. I know you will be there for that, man. How awesome. Dude, he's gonna hit him. me the other day, ask me, was I coming? Like, what is it you talking about? <laughs> like, of course I'm gonna be there. <laughs> what are you talking about? How big is that I'm gonna be there. though? You're gonna be on that field with him, man. You're gonna see all of his hard work, because you, better than anybody, have got to really see the work and the time he put into his craft, and now he's finally getting recognized for it, man. How special is that going to be for somebody that was his mentee? Look, man, this dude, the fact that he's having to wait this long is, 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 it, it, it's, it's, it's criminal. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but, but what people don't understand is we've been connected since I've retired a lot, a lot more since I retired and, and over the years in my career, like we always stayed connected. And for me, it was, it was, it was easy because I looked up to him, not for what he did on the field, but more what he did off the field, his charity work, the business that he's done since he's retired. And we work with some of the same companies now. So it, it's, Nothing to do. Like I say, we never got disconnected. Like he was always my mentor and still is. Like we we make sure we are on the phone at least two or three times a year, no matter what. We're texting about something. You know, he's presenting opportunities to me and vice versa. So it's there's always been that bond. So I'm just happy to finally see him get the recognition that's been overdue for all these years. Like nobody should ever wear 28 ever, ever again around the whole league like it's he means that much to the younger generation and the career that he had i mean this dude played 21 years come on man you you tell me a corner getting past 15 these days it's not happening so i mean i got a lot of respect for him i'm just happy i could get there and witness it in person and, and watch him cry again because you know he I, I could tell this one got to him you know this one this one really got to him and it shows the love that you guys have for this organization and this fan base, the way that you guys get emotional, the way that you guys show love. So thank you for sharing that. And of course, we got to talk about today's game. We got a lot of young secondary in there. We got Quan Martin. We got Mike Sanderson. We have Emmanuel Forbes. We have all these young guys and a lot of things are changing. How do you feel about the, the lay of the land now for Washington and how bright our future looks? Well, it looks great. I think, you know, defensively, we've always had some good pieces, just not been consistent. And I think the the, the one constant thing that we will have been missing is the quarterback. Yeah. And we, we've had a good running game here and there. And Brian Robinson looks like a, a beast. <laughs> like For some reason, man, he just looked beast mode now for some reason. I don't know what it is. <laughs> he always and was then, that. He always was. I just didn't no, get the opportunity. You know, it, but it's, it feels different. Yeah. Like it, it feels like he has another level of confidence that I hadn't seen. He pops out on, on the screen to me. like, And I feel like in some ways that that reflects the leadership that he has silently. I don't know who he is or what type of person he is, but it, it just feels like he he's energizing the team for some reason. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, it's obviously early in his career, but, you know, one thing about this league, if you've noticed, man, you got to be mobile. Like, the, all the good quarterbacks now have some mobility. I think the least mobile guy is Joe Burrow, and he can move a little bit. So, <laughs> it, I mean, it's – if you don't have some mobility, you're not going to win early. And Jalen Daniels looks good in that pocket. But when you can dial up a quarterback run here and there, Lamar Jackson-like, 
I mean, it's dangerous, man. It, it creates another headache for the defense, something else they got to work on. So you just never know what's coming at you. And, boy, the coordinator got to be in heaven with a guy like this. I think we are all in heaven, man, and we cannot wait till Sunday's game against the Browns to see them boys go out there and just continue to get better. And before we let you go, on Sunday as well, uh, Santana Moss, another guy that works with me and Fred a lot, um, he will be the legend of the game. And you were a defensive back for a very long time, so there's nobody prepared for receivers quite like you. Can you give us a little bit of Santana Moss story, something about Santana Moss when you would line up against him and play him. What kind of player was he and how cool is it to see an OG like that get, get honored just like you were honored last season? Yeah, fortunate for me, I never had to match up against him. So I didn't I didn't have to like really tear into who he was. But, <laughs> you know, he one thing you couldn't, you know, get away from it, uh, or at least ignore was his speed. I mean, he was just one of those guys. I mean, he was always taking the lid off the defense and just really putting pressure on you. So I can remember preparing that week, and we were just always trying to figure out, like, when is he going deep? And i never forget, he beat me on a corner route. They were in some kind of bunch formation or something. And he was lined up at the first receiver. Now, usually the first receiver don't go deep. He's usually the one going under or running something short. And it just ran a corner from that number one spot. And I'm like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> and, man, like I say, man, this dude here, he's one of those guys that's super underrated. We don't talk about enough. I mean, every time his highlights pop up on my timeline, I just sit, I, I just sit there and watch him. I mean, because he was amazing to watch. I only played him that one. I think that one, maybe once other when he was uh, with the Jets, but that that one time I remember vividly. Wow, man. And, and it was so great just having legends like you guys as part of this building. I think it speaks to not only the fan base, how much you guys love the fans, but just the people that you guys are too, man. So, Champ, we're so happy to have you back in the fold, man. We ain't going to let you go. We're going to hold on to you tight now, man, Champ. We're so happy to have you, man. Oh, man, I appreciate it. Yes, sir, man. Thank you for your time, bro. We really appreciate having you on, man. All right, man. Looking forward to seeing y'all. All right, peace, man. Commanders family, we appreciate you watching this episode of Next Man Up. You can stream every episode of Next Man Up, even last season's, on the Commanders YouTube page or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, Commanders family, I am Brian Cobra Jr., and this is Next Man Up. Next Man Up.